It is indeed a privilege and an honor for me to introduce Dr. Steve Johnson, President of the Albert Ellis Institute in New York. Dr. Johnson has doctorates in philosophy and evidence-based psychotherapy and currently serves as a professor of graduate counseling and he formed the MA in addictions counseling at Columbia International University. His research interests have included integrating faith and traditional religious practices to address anxiety, overcoming loneliness, the use of movement and psychotherapy in conjunction with cognitive, behavioral, and emotive interventions, and developing a threat opportunity model as a unifying factor across psychotherapy models. His publications include multiple chapters and books on psychotherapy on topics such as the role of culture in psychotherapy, REBT marriage and family therapy, overcoming religious conflicts and marital counseling, integrating REBT and religious content and therapy, etc. He has authored 14 books on topics such as medieval Islamic epistemology, REBT pastoral counseling, and is currently working on his first fiction novel. He has lectured on topics of counseling, religion, and philosophy at over 300 universities in the United States, the Middle East, Europe, and Canada. Currently, Dr. Johnson serves as the president of the Albert Ellis Institute in New York City, where he has been instrumental in the development of online training to broaden access to high quality mental health education internationally. Dr. Johnson will address us on the topic, decatastrophizing during the catastrophic. Over to Dr. Johnson. Some of the things that we'll be talking about, I will focus on catastrophizing or awfulizing, but I have to cover other things you know, to, so that that's, um, there's a context for, for that discussion. And one question they wanted me to cover was why I switched to REBT. Um, I'm gonna try to say this without alienating some people, but my initial training was in psychodynamic psychotherapy, object relations and self-psychology, in particular, more object relations than, than and self-psychology, and I practiced that for a um, number of years. I was a professor, but I also had my private, uh, private practice. And um, I was a little frustrated because it seemed to take a long time for my clients to, to get better, et cetera. And then um, I uh, remembered as a grad student that I had read um, Al Dr. Albert Ellis and it seemed to be a really nice short-term model with some nice uh, you know, research uh, base to it. And so I wrote Dr. Ellis a letter and I said, I'm very interested in your model. And by that time I was living um, in New York City, right? And so I said, I would like to study, um, but you know, I'm a person of faith and, and I know right now you've been kind of negative on us. And so, um, but it just so happened that he had, it was a time when he had become fascinated with integrating faith into psychotherapy. So he's, I can't repeat exactly what he said because he loved his four letter words. And, um, but he told me to get a part of my anatomy down there and talk to him. And so we talked and at the end of the talk, he said, you're hired. And so I started in as a fellow, became an approved supervisor, and then I did group therapy with Dr. Ellis. And, um, and then uh, eventually they asked me to stay on as a staff, uh, psychotherapist went on to uh, create um, uh, an affiliate training center and um, etc. And then um, the uh, I had been vice president and then the president stepped down and so I was nominated and voted in as the president which means that when I do workshops at the Ellis Institute they don't have to pay me now because I'm the I'm the president. So a little good a little bad right? Um, but I was really, really impressed with the model because it was much quicker and we got solid, uh, solid results and um, 
also it permitted me, a, uh, gave me an opportunity to do some research that I was really interested in. Dr. Ellis wanted me to work on primarily on how do we integrate faith in terms of content, but also practices, traditional religious practices into REBT, being true to REBT, but open to the strengths of uh, faith. And we'll get to that uh, a little bit later. So um, I uh, really want to zero in on, um, on ovalizing or catastrophizing as our friends in CBT say. But um, part of what I want to do throughout is to uh, address some of the misconceptions because I've heard all kinds of things in the years I've been with REBT. They go, oh, doesn't REBT believe this? And I'm like, what planet are you from? Because we have never taught that, right? But, you know, all kinds of misconceptions. So I will try to address those as I go through the model, focusing on um, on catastrophizing, but let's put this in a context. The heart of um, REBT is what we call the ABC model. And ABC means simple, and this part is simple. It gets a little more complicated a little bit later, but the ABC is very, very simple. A simply means um, activating event. I mean, something's happened. That something could be in the past, it could be going on right now, or particularly in the case of anxiety, something that we are anticipating, right, in, in, in the future. I think we're probably the only creature that can disturb ourselves about things that aren't even that haven't even happened, right? My dog never seems to get upset about the future. It's always right in the here and now. The B stands for beliefs, and I'll dig into that in just a minute. And the C stands for consequences. And by consequences, we mean um, emotions, behaviors, and even physiological responses. Although we pay attention to physiological responses, but it's the MDs that will treat a number of those, although we do have some interventions to deal with that. So let's put those together. There is an erroneous, I call it the erroneous emotional model, and that would be that A causes C, that so, there's some event and that that event causes our emotions, behaviors, physiological responses. In fact, we speak that way, or at least in English we do. We go, you made me mad. So you're the cause of my anger, okay? And psycho, some psychotherapy models believe that A causes C. Psychodynamics, psychoanalysis is really about the A. They will come in and talk about the A over and over and over. And, um, but we have found that research, um, you know, and this is consistent with REBT, that that's not quite the case that there's an intervening variable that science ignored for a long time. And that is sure there are situations and situations are highly relevant to the way we think and we feel, right? Um, but the intervening variable is uh, the B, the beliefs. About what? About the A. So something happens, uh, we have thoughts about that something and those thoughts result in our emotions and behaviors to a large, uh, to a large degree. Those people who want to, so I would say that A triggers our beliefs and the beliefs would be the direct cause of emotions, behaviors, et cetera. If people want to talk about causality, um, you can, I'm fine with that. Then if you want to talk about causality, then A would be the distant cause of our emotions and behaviors, but the proximate or the close cause would be our beliefs about that, right? Um, so, A's are, I mean, most people don't just walk down the street without an event and go, whoops, I'm depressed. You know, usually there's some kind of precipitating event. So that is the connection that we have in RBT. However, we are not that linear. Albert has always said that if we change the A, we change the B and the C. If we change the B, we change the A and the C. If we change the C, we change the A and the B. They're all interconnected, which is good news because our therapy can look at each of those and we, and we do that at times. We tend to focus on the B in our ABT. So the heart of the therapy, of course, is ABC. We narrow that down. It is what we call the BC connection. What are the beliefs that you have that are causing those emotions and behaviors and this is actually very good news um, that A doesn't directly cause C, that the Bs do, because 
if A's caused it, then you need to move. You need to get on a perfect island, but as soon as you arrive, it's not perfect anymore, right? And whereas if B, if we can change the B, it's not gonna be easy. Just let me tell you, changing the B is not easy. It takes some work because you've had a lot of practice with you know, these um, beliefs that are kind of um, Meshuggah, they're a little bit crazy. Uh, so, um, so, but we can with effort change the B and therefore we can get change of the emotions and, and behaviors. Let's zero in on those Bs though. I tend not to use, although it's in the literature for, to talk about beliefs in terms of rational and irrational. And I think some people will hear the being told that their beliefs are irrational is kind of an attack. It's not meant that. So I just say helpful and unhelpful, right? It, I don't have to deal with all the, you know, the, the, um, the fallout from labeling something as irrational, particularly with individuals with the personality disorders can take that as a personal attack. So why go there? It just makes therapy a little more complicated. So, um, so let me go through what those beliefs are. I'll cover the unhelpful and then what's the corollary helpful emotion. And then we'll talk about what's the difference between the two. But it's kind of an ideal vocabulary. Do we use it all the time? No, we will go with what the client says. But sometimes if we have a vocabulary that we share, it makes therapy go a little bit easier. But we don't demand that they use it. So one of the beliefs is, and Al said, Albert Ellis said, this is the core disturbance belief, is demandingness. Um, these are, you know, when you're being demanding, you don't have to say it, but it can be in your head. When you're using words and you are going to have to translate this into Urdu for yourself, but um, you know, it's the should, the ought, the must, the have to, and the needs, right? You must love me in the way that I want to be loved. You know, uh, those kinds of, of of, of things. I need for you to listen to me. No, you don't, but it would be nice, wouldn't it? And so instead of the demand, what we'd like, we would say that the helpful alternative would be, you know, to have a preference, a wish, a desire, or maybe a godly desire if you're coming from a faith position, right? Um, another one would be the heart of what we're talking about today is awfulizing or catastrophizing. This is, um, this is recognizing that something is bad, but that is not awfulizing if you recognize that something is bad. Awfulizing is when you spend an inordinate amount of time going, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad, this is, you know, those kinds of things, that's awfulizing. It is a process. It is not the declaration that this event is bad, but it is to continuously go over it. The ING, awfulizing means that it is a process, not a one-time event, right? Um, and um, and a lot of the time that's misunderstood. They go, oh, so you can't believe that something's awful. If you want to believe something awful, believe something's awful. But it's probably not a good idea to spend idea to spend all your time going, oh, this is terrible, this is horrible, this is awful. You know, it it causes some uh, some problems, right? Um, so um, and in fact, if like in COVID where people are dying in huge numbers. If someone comes in and they go, it's just awful. It would not be a great idea to go, well, it could be worse. You know, we could have COVID and two other pandemics at the same time. Nobody's gonna listen to you, right? COVID is bad enough and let's recognize that it's bad, but let's look at ways that we don't have to spend a lot of time going over and over and over in it because when we do that, then we get the negative con negative consequences. Um, so it's probably not a good idea to say, ah, they said awful, let me jump in and try to dispute that. You'd lose, it comes across as lacking empathy, right? And you'll lose the client. Another one is uh, frustration intolerance. Um, in the book, SOS Help for Emotions, Lynn Clark calls it, I can't stand it itis. Um, I can't stand this, this is too much. Uh, it's overwhelming, um, and, but the opposite, the opposite of this would be um, not liking it, but tolerating it. Realize, I don't like this, I wouldn't sign up for it, but you know what, I'm still kicking, I'm still alive, you know, I'm, I'm tolerating this. Because if you believe you can't stand it, then you're going to act in ways that are not really helpful. 
the other one is the, and the last is really global evaluation. The global evaluation of the self, others, life, and the world. Global evaluation of the self would be what? I'm a loser, I'm a failure, you know, I'm an idiot, um, those kinds of things. Or I'm wonderful, but you're an idiot, you're a failure, right? Uh, you put the self down over time, you usually end up with depression. You put others down, we tend to get angry, right? So, um, so what we prefer is that an individual, instead of having a global evaluation, recognize that we do things that are bad, that we have some great, we have some negative traits, so do others. The world has some negative stuff going on, as we see, and, and life has some bumpy roads, right? Um, and, uh, but we're, we can handle it. Okay. I want to go back to demanding us because people of faith, Muslims, Christians, Jews, whatever, right? Will they think that somehow REBT is against their, the demands that are within their religion? And we're not at all. Um, we look at one kind of demand as problematical, and then there are other demands that are not problematical. The problematic one is what I would call a metaphysical demand. If I demand that situations and others be a particular way, or that I be a particular way, absolutely, right? Like they have no free will, I'm the center of the universe and they must do it because I want them to do that, right? Um, when it comes to religious demands, we go, eh, have them, that's your, that's your thing, right? Do, although we'll talk about some, demands that religious people have that are not helpful, right? But if, if uh, you know, it's kind of like um, for Jews and Christians or, or Muslims, right? Uh, thou shalt not kill. That's probably good news, you know, and, and, and really great wisdom. Don't go around killing people. Um, you know, it's not helpful, it's, um, et, et cetera. And people don't like you when you kill people they love, right? So, um, but, <clears throat> that's a religious demand. If we go, and you absolutely have to believe that, and you absolutely have to act on that, now you just moved into the twilight zone, right? Then you could disturb yourself. It's not the religious demand that causes the problem. It is your demandingness about the religion, right? That's the cause of problem. So Al called, he's fine with religion. It's religiosity, the rigidity, and the demandingness within a religion not really within the religion, it's within the person that causes the, uh, the problem. Um, um, ethical demands, fine, don't kill, right? Don't steal, all of those demands are fine. Um, we don't look at that, hold whatever ethical view you want and then legal. If it says drive 25 miles an hour here, that demand makes sense, that's a law, follow it, right? And then the other one would be practical demands. If you want to pass the course, you must study. Now that's a demand that's very practical. That's not going to cause any emotional disturbance. So it's only when we are rigidly demanding that situations be a particular way, right? Not about religion, not about ethics, not about the law, and not about practical issues. So it's a limited sphere, right? Um, so also, Interesting, while we're on religion, does our EBT think that we can be sane and productive and actually believe in God and practice a religion? Yeah, of course. Um, Al's later writings and my whole career is on that particular issue. However, a person can hold to a faith and be mentally ill or engage in dysfunctional um, uh, actions, right? Typically, though, um, they're demanding about the content of the faith rather than believing the content of faith. There's a big difference, right? Big, big difference. Um, and then let's go back to awfulizing. Awfulizing is really important, catastrophizing because of the, pro if you uh, awfulize over a long period of time, then you predispose yourself to depression, anxiety. It is not helpful and it's not been helpful during COVID, but I want to get to that a little bit later. Now, some people, and I would say most people don't, who don't know anything about REBT or who have been superficially trained in REBT don't realize that cognitions, beliefs 
are not synonymous with thoughts and cognitions within REBT. We, we distinguish between inferences and beliefs. An inference is a cognition and a belief is a cognition, but they're different kinds of cognitions. Inferences are those cognitions that are about the meaning that we give to an event, right? So for example, if I could see all of you right now, and I see that three of you are sleeping, um, then I might go, oh, they, they dislike my uh, performance. That is the meaning I'm giving to that, right? And then belief is not just giving meaning, but an evaluation or goodness or badness about something. So if I said, they shouldn't be sleeping while I'm talking. This is terrible. This is horrible. I can't stand it. Those are beliefs, right? It's because I'm engaging in evaluations. The interesting thing is, and it separates CBT and REBT. Um, we in REBT tend to believe that emotions and, and behaviors are largely caused by beliefs more than inferences. Inferences are true or false, but you could have the same inference and a lot of different beliefs and your emotions would be different, right? So let's say you are asleep while I'm, um, some of you are asleep and I'm going, they don't like my performance. And then my belief is they shouldn't do that. So I might get angry, right? Or, oh my gosh, this is terrible. This is horrible. I'm going to be a failure as a lecturer. Then I might get, that's the belief. Then I would be anxious. Same inference, right? They don't like it. But the belief changes, then the emotion change. Or I might even be happy. I might go, I don't care. I never liked him anyway. Ha 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 ha. You know what I mean? And so then I'm happy about it. Now that's a little strange, but you see what I mean? Same inference, different beliefs, different outcome. So that's kind of the proof on, on that one. So let's go back. Unhelpful um, beliefs tend to cause dysfunctional emotions and self-sabotaging behaviors. And by self-sabotaging behaviors, we mean behaviors that inhibit or get in the way or prevent us reaching our goals our personal goals, our professional goals, our interpersonal goals, our spiritual goals, right? So that's why we would like to, um, to change them. Let me give an example related to COVID. If I believe that I can't stand social isolation, I might experience anxiety. And the result of that is that I might engage in unhelpful behaviors, right? I might not wear a mask. I might not engage in social distancing. I might um, uh, start drinking or taking drugs, right? Because in the United States, I don't know about Pakistan, but in the United States, the death rate due to overdose has just skyrocketed as, as well as suicide. Or I don't get my task done that I need to get done you know, from day to day, and I just sit on the, I just sit on my couch and eat chocolate, right? And so, and gain weight. None of those are good, but they come from that unhelpful, uh, unhelpful uh, belief. Okay, a little about emotions. We classify emotions as functional or dysfunctional. Um, dysfunctional might be depression. The functional equivalent would be sadness, anxiety dysfunctional. Its correlate would be concern. Um, feeling hurt is dysfunctional because hurt tends to go toward either anger or depression. Um, and disappoint, disappointment would be the functional equivalent. Anger would be dysfunctional. The functional equivalent might be righteous indignation about something, right? For example, the protesters, the peaceful protesters are engaging in righteous indignation. So we don't have a problem with that. People that may be burning things up and killing people, that's another issue. That's anger, right? So what, and we know because the dysfunctionality of the outcome of their actions, right? Guilt is dysfunctional and remorse would be the, um, would be the equivalent. What's the difference between the, the functional and dysfunctional? This is a big, big, big point and an important point in REBT. The difference is qualitative, not quantitative. What we mean is, let's take depression. If I have depression, it's not true that if I dial down the energy of depression, I get sadness. No, 
it is the functional emotion is not a watered down version of the dysfunctional emotion. The difference is qualitative. And the qualitative difference is the dysfunctional emotion feels very painful and it tends to sabotage behaviors, right? Us uh, reaching our goals. Functional emotions, which may be negative. I mean, who wants to feel sad? It's a negative emotion, but it's functional because you can get your work done being sad. It's really hard to get your work done and feel really depressed, right? So that distinguishes them. The difference is not qualitative and quantitative. The other, the other issue that people confuse all the time, my students confuse this all the time. And so I go back and lecture on it, is people think that an emotion is either helpful or unhelpful based upon the seriousness of the activating event. If the activating event is very serious, like COVID, they may go, oh, then anxiety is normal. Of course, anxiety is normal. It's just not helpful, right? And so um, all of these negative emotions, helpful or unhelpful, are normal. Otherwise, we wouldn't be having them, right? But um, the question is, we don't determine the, whether an emotion is helpful or not helpful based upon the A of the activating event. It's based upon the outcomes. Does it sabotage, is it terribly painful and does it sabotage um, you know, our behaviors? Many people think that what our EBT is about is get rid of all your emotion. Become like Spock on Star Trek, oh, Star Trek right? No. We want you to have the full range of emotions, even if you're having dysfunctional emotions. Is it awful to have dysfunctional emotions? No, welcome to the human race. We as humans are a little bit nutty at times, right? And sometimes we're gonna disturb ourselves. Just enjoy being a human, right? And try to change that if you, if you, if you can, okay? Um, one of the dominant emotions that we see in COVID right now is anxiety. And, um, and beliefs that are associated with anxiety. First, there's an inference. The inference is that COVID is a threat, right? We are interpreting this as a threat, a threat to our life or a threat to our comfort. It's not comfortable to be able to go to the grocery store and just buy what we want, you know? Oh my gosh, there's no toilet paper, right? So the Americans got all bent out of shape about, about toilet paper. Like, what did they do in the 1700s when they didn't have toilet paper, right? So that's a threat to our convenience. And then it's also a threat to our lives. We call that ego anxiety or discomfort anxiety. A threat to your life is ego anxiety. A threat to your comfort is discomfort anxiety. And the beliefs are demanding us about that threat. That threat should not have happened right? I must be safe and protected from COVID. You don't get it, you know? That is just a part of, uh, a part of life. Or frustration intolerance. I can't stand being cooped up in the house looking at my wife and husband and or husband and children all the time, you know? I can't handle it. I want to go out and talk to people and, you know, and, and hug them and shake hands and do whatever we do as, as humans, right? And the result of those beliefs is avoidance. Every emotion has an action potential and the action potential for anxiety is avoidance. If you're anxious about something, you want to avoid it. So that's what we're doing. We want to avoid the feeling of anxiety, right? That we cause by those uh, um, thoughts and we avoid it by drinking too much, eating too much, yelling and screaming too much, saying, I'm not going to think about it. I'm just not going to think about it. I'm not going to put my mask on. I'm just going to live my life. Okay, well, if you do this, life will be nasty, brutish, and short for you. Okay, so, the, um, so you see the negative consequences of doing that. So how do we help people? How do we help people here? We do this in three different ways. And, I'm, and here, there's a misconception. We have cognitive ways that we change those unhelpful beliefs. We have emotive ways and we have behavioral ways. So nobody asks, no, don't ask me a question and say, why is REBT too cognitive? Two thirds of our interventions are non-cognitive, okay? So it, we're not all about cognition. Although changing those unhelpful beliefs is often the most, is often the most efficient way, okay? 
the others may take a little bit longer. Some behavioral uh, techniques, though, don't take that long. And actually, some of the behavioral interventions we want with um, certain emotions like anxiety and depression, because anxiety is about avoidance. And um, there in Torah, there's a verse that's really nice. It's about um, Goliath. Um, is, that, is that story in, in Quran? Yes. Like, okay. So um, I can't keep all of my books straight. And so the, it's a real short verse. And David ran to meet Goliath. So he's really anxious about <laughs> this big giant, right? But he overcomes his anxiety and moves toward it rather than avoid, right? So, and good outcomes of that. Now, it's not always good to rush toward a threat. Like if there's a gun, if you rush toward it, something's wrong, okay? So that's probably not a good, a good idea. But in that case, quite okay. So, um, and when, um, and with depression, it's not so much avoidance, but withdrawal. We withdraw from life. And that's why we do behavior activation as a treatment so that they get back into life, right? Same with grief. Um, so the cognitive would be, we debate the de beliefs. And there are lots of ways that we do that. I don't wanna get bogged down. There's a functional one that really boils down to, hey, how's holding that belief helping you? What are you getting out of that, right? And they realize it's not really helping them. This, causing more of the emotion. Empirical, where's the evidence for your belief? Logical, a lot of people don't get into that because we go, how does it logically follow that because you would like the situation to be th this way that it must be that way? And people will look at you like you have three heads because most people don't think logically, right? But they do like the functional, how is it helping you? Because everybody's interested in themselves and how is it impacting them? Or friendship. Um, Let's say you had a friend that held that belief that they were absolutely worthless and a failure. Would you say, um, yeah, I think uh, you are. No, you wouldn't say that. I mean, that's, a, that's not a bad friend. You might say that to your enemy, right? It, some of the Americans want to say that to Trump or whatever, or whoever our politician is at the time. But, you know, it's not, real, not really a, a sort of friend. Um, and so um, those are the kind of some cognitive ways. And then there are emotive ways, which would be to do these with really strong emotion, right? We're generating the emotion because when we generate the emotion, right? Then, and we help them decrease that emotion or change that emotion. We change one, we change the others. A lot of people think we have to change the belief and, and then we get the behaviors change or the emotion changes, not true. Um, sometimes, but you know, my wife is, is a professor and she, at an engineering university and she would say, Steve, we've been invited to an engineering party. And I'm like, those two things don't go together, engineering and party. Most of the engineers, I didn't think it was party type people, right? And so I said, well, Carol, I would love to go, but I don't think I can because I think I'm going to be sick that night. And so she goes, <laughs> in great love, she would say, no, you're going. And since I'm the head of the house, I was obedient to her, right? And so I went and, and I would go and I'd have conversation or the chicken dish would be good. And so I didn't think it was awful. But what changed? I changed my behavior first and then the emotion changed, right? So that's the good thing about REBT and why we have these different kinds of interventions. And then behavioral interventions really is, let's face it, let's just face the thing that, you know, that you're anxious or, or depressed about. Let's, and, and let's move beyond that. So we use a combination of those. We take a look at what works the best and then we go with that. And every client's, every client's uh, different. Here's another misunderstanding. And am I talking too much? I'll get over here in a real, real quickly here, okay? Um, a lot of people think that we're about the treatment of symptoms and not about the person. And we do uh, focus on symptoms because when clients come in, they usually come in with a problem with their symptoms, right? I'm depressed, make me undepressed, I'm anxious, make me whatever, right? Um, and, but we, I'm gonna get to this in a minute, but in REBT, the client chooses the goal, not the therapist. And if they come in and they want to work 
on an emotion, I'm going to say, sorry, we got to deal with yourself first. No, we will work on the emotion. They're the boss. They set the agenda and we go with that. And when they see change, they're more likely to open up about wanting change in other areas of their lives. The other thing is the heart of REBT. And my uh, best friend, the late uh, James McMahon, made this his biggest issue, was unconditional self-acceptance. We are about the client and wanting the client to unconditionally accept themselves no matter what they've done in life and no matter what their symptoms are. Because there are certain conditions where the symptoms are going to last a while, like PTSD or some personality disorders, right? They will have symptoms for years and years sometimes. It's better that they unconditionally accept themselves so they'll have resilience in the face of those symptoms, right? So we are about, that is all about the individual, right? And I am to unconditionally accept them because we also have unconditional acceptance of the other. Um, and we try to focus on the self by saying, you know, lighten up on yourself. It might be helpful if you didn't, you weren't so demanding toward the self. So we really are addressing the the self at the bottom at the at the bottom. Um, another one is a lot of people think that we don't consider early childhood um, events or attachment, and that's just nonsense. One of my big areas of work right now is reconceptualizing an attachment in ways that we can talk with attachment theorists, right? Um, of course, early childhood events are important. Our approach will be empirical. Um, there, are, you know, Kaiser Permanente has developed these ACEs scores, adverse childhood events. We know the more ad adverse childhood events, the worse the outcome, largely because those we develop unhelpful beliefs about the early childhood events, and those cause our emotional uh, uh, disturbance. Okay, um, and. And that's why it's so important to love your kid, right? Love the kid, um, engage in adequate nurturing and take care of the child's physical and emotional welfare because that's gonna help that kid develop better beliefs. No guarantee. You can be a really great parent and the kid could be messed up, um, you know, because um, we only have so much influence on the children. Our influence is important, but as they get older, our influence decreases over, over time. Okay. Um, and, then, and then trauma. I wanted to talk about that and religious interventions, and then I will um, stop and we will have a conversation. Okay. My focus, my big area of interest is, is trauma and treating PTSD. And many people wonder if there's a particular kind of treatment that works. Well, we do know, uh, we've known since 92 kind of phases of treatment, but if we look today at the treatments that work, uh, if you look at Division 12 of the American Psychological Association website, you will find for like PTSD that there are five, six different kinds of treatment that all work similarly well but their um, approach is quite different. There are those that are exposure-based and those that don't do any exposure and they're more present-centered and both with good uh, outcomes. Often what's common to both of those is some degree of changing the unhelpful, unhelpful uh, beliefs. Uh, one that people question today is EMDR. Well, uh, Division 12 of the APA says that EMDR is, um, is an evidence-based treatment, that it is effective, but they wrote questionable because there are two parts, right? There's the part where, you know, move the finger or the sound or whatever, and then there's the more CBT, REBT part of it. We don't know which part actually contributes to the outcome more, right? So, um, we, I go with whatever is evidence-based and, and look at that. There are forms that are harmful, har forms of treatment for PTSD that are harmful. And so it is really important to take a look at what those are. Now, I wanna end on what my, why Al had me at the Institute in the first place. And that is 
looking at religion and religious interventions. That's my research for about 25 years. And um, can religion and religious interventions be helpful in overcoming irrational beliefs? Absolutely. There's no doubt about it. The research, I mean, I just finished a research study on using prayer to address anxiety. And prayer had a larger effect than the ordinary uh, tradi traditional treatments. But what we did was combine prayer with the ABC model so that when they pray, they name the A, what the situation is. They name their irrational, unhelpful beliefs about that situation, and they name their emotions. And then they incorporate. Now, if I'm working with Muslims, and about a third of my practice was Muslims, uh, then we would look at Quran and Hadith. And so we would look at um, um, the ayats within Quran that would um, function as a dispute of their unhelpful beliefs, right? Or um, um, the um, Hadith are, 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 are excellent too. Now, here's the important thing about which, what you choose though. We don't choose a Quranic verse or a Hadith because it'll make us feel good. We want it to function as a dispute or a debate, right? We don't want them to feel better. We want them to get better. We hope they feel better when they get better. But a lot of people use verses to go, oh, I like that, it makes me feel good. Well, let's not so fo focus on just the temporary feel good, right? If you just wanna feel good, go take a pill, right? That might even be faster. But if you wanna get better, then why don't you cooperate with Allah to change those beliefs within you, right? Um, or Christians, cooperate with the Holy Spirit or Jews, talk to your rabbi, you know, to, or listen to Torah, listen to the writings of Moses. But use the, the Quran and Hadith to actually change the dysfunctional uh, belief, okay? Not feel good. That's a, that's a real big difference. By the way, I co-authored a article on this that should be coming out soon with a Muslim psychologist, um, great Muslim psychologist, and we, and, and it's about using Quran and Hadith to, um, to get some uh, mental and emotional benefit. Now, one last thing. Oh, what about fasting? Um, um, I have diabetes, so I can't fast. It's the only time I'm happy that I have diabetes, okay? And so, um, but fasting is excellent if the doctor says you can do it, if it'll help with frustration and tolerance. Because sometimes if it's really hot and you're really thirsty and you just walked by a water fountain, it is, um, it's really frustrating. You're like, hey, no, nobody's gonna see. Uh, Allah's forgiving, you know? And then we might want to, um, we might want to change that. And so actually the fast can help a person develop frustration tolerance that can generalize into other areas of life. So I love the fast and I love the use of Quran Hadith, but you know, for Muslims, I mean, I wouldn't use Quran Hadith with my Jewish clients or my Christian clients, you know, but particularly for what, what's appropriate for them. And here's an amazing thing. Uh, a meta-analysis came out of Johns Hopkins University where, where my wife went to the university and was looking at um, the benefits, uh, the relationship between faith and um, religious actions and um, mental and emotional outcomes. And we found that the content of the belief was not terribly important, not as important as acting upon your faith. You need to put, you need to get your rear end up off the couch and put your faith into action. You guys have it made. You get the five pillars. Five pillars of what? About action, right? Get to work, do something. Um, those th those give benefit. If you just sit around and think, you know, about the akida, that's good. I mean, at a spiritual level, but it may not get you the mental and emotional benefit in the long run as putting your faith into action. Make sense? And so. Um, the exception was there's one belief that was tremendously, tremendously important for mental health. And that is the nature of the God in which you believe. If you believe 
that God is just and merciful, compassionate and loving. And every surah begins, right, with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So um, you have that, you know, don't just recite it, take it in, you know, and really believe in the nature of, 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 of Allah with those attributes, right? That that, if you believe in that, in that kind of God, you tend to have higher self-esteem than those who believe in a hateful, vengeful God, okay? The rest, get busy and take action. Get busy and take action. Get up, go to prayer. If you can't, you know, there are times if you're sick, etc., cetera, that you that can't, that can't uh, do it. So why don't I be quiet that I could go the rest of the day, but you're already, you would be bored out of your mind. So why don't we do this and take any questions that you may have, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we have a raise hand option and uh, people who want to ask questions, kindly raise your hands. They either fell asleep or I covered everything. You covered a lot of <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, I don't have any questions to ask because everything that I did think about you addressed and quite well. I must say it was mind blowing, Dr. Johnson. Really, your command over Quran and Hadith and your understanding of uh, the Muslim faith paired with your absolute command over REBT principles. Um, you know, I, I used to think that I'm pretty good at um, using REBT, but I think you've uh, just disabused me of any conceit. You're too, you're too humble. No, it was we'll, really bring you to, we'll bring you to New York and you'll get rid of that humble, okay? <laughs> Right, okay, Adhan Nyazi has a question. So Adhan, please uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. And hello, Shashir, I saw your name that you were there. Uh. Sir, uh, Sir, Dr. Steve said, we do not do determine our emotions as helpful or non-helpful. So what are the ways in which we can determine that how our emotions are helpful and non-helpful? Yeah, in, in, um, I covered it, but I covered it very quickly in my New York City style, right? Um, so the difference between the emotions, um, whether they're helpful or non-helpful, is not the intensity of the emotion. Don't look at the intensity because uh, helpful, and I'm talking about negative emotions here, not positive emotions, um, because most people with a positive emotion don't come in and say, oh, I'm too positive, help me. Um, so I'm just looking at negative, negative emotions. So let's take uh, depression and, and, uh, depression and um, sadness. Depression is the word that we would give to uh, the dysfunctional emotion and, the, and sadness to the functional emotion. The difference would be the beliefs that they have. So for depression, there's going to be a demand. There's going to be the demandiness, the, perhaps the awfulizing, frustration, intolerance. And with depression, there's, there tends to be a global negative rating of the self or sometimes with life conditions. Um, with sadness, we don't see those dysfunctional emotions. So it's always important to ask about the emotion. Um, with sadness, um, they would have more, they, not, not the demandingness and not the awfulizing, et cetera. The other thing is the, um, the, the emotion of dysfunctional emotion would tend to get in the way of the client attaining their desired goals. And I said those goals could be personal, professional, interpersonal, and even spiritual. So if they have the emotion and it's really, really uh, sabotaging them in reaching their goals, we know that those are dysfunctional. Okay? Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you for the question. Thank you so much.
Yes. We, we do have time for some more questions, right, Dr. Johnson? Oh, sure, sure. Okay. Yes. Let's see if there are any hands up. There is Sahira, Sana, Sharmeen, Dr. Kiani. Nidas, Sarah, Dr. Sarah is here. Dr. Sarah, would you like to say something? Ask him a question, maybe have a comment. Dr. Sarah Shahid. Just a second. Uh, yes, a comment. Comment. It, it was wonderful, excellent. It, it was a absolute delight to listen to Dr. Johnson. And uh, I must say, Dr. Asa, you organize it very well. Because uh, you know, maybe Dr. Johnson doesn't know it, but Dr. Asa has been arranging it for days. And every step, every development, he would keep us in the loop on the WhatsApp group. But it was a real pleasure, Dr. Johnson. You, I mean, you um, built it so well starting from the basics, the basic conceptions and misconceptions, and then connecting it to our life today, um, connecting it with our religion and connecting with the current situation, our experiences during the pandemic, everything. Uh, so it was a delight. Thank you very much. Thank you. I can't wait till COVID goes out of town so that I can get to Pakistan. That would be so Oh, cool. yeah. You know? That would be brilliant. That would be great. Brilliant, yeah. I would love to organize that one, too. <laughs> okay, there is... Uh, we will see yeah. if our governments cooperate. <laughs> is yeah. Sashid? Uh, yes. Sashid. Uh, good evening, uh, Dr. Steve. Uh, Sashir. Hey, Sashir, how are you doing? Yeah, actually. Uh, I have been invited by uh, Sara Mahmood uh, to this uh, webinar. I don't know whether I'm allowed to be here. <laughs> uh, Dr. Thank Asir, you thank you very You're much. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right. Okay. So, Dr. Steve, I have a question for you. Um, like, we talk a lot about negative emotions that are not helpful. Right. So, um, is there anything written about uh, positive emotions that are not helpful? Good question. And um, I don't know as much has been written, but I do know in my training, and I don't know about yours, Shashir, um, that they, it was very clear that some positive emotions are dysfunctional. Let's say that, um, um, and I think often because sometimes they engage in denial, right? To, be, to experience this positive uh, emotion. Let's say, um, let me give an example. Um, my daughters are older, but when they were really little, you know how little, little kids run fevers uh, quite, quite often when they're cutting teeth or they catch something at school or whatever. And, and let's say the fever goes up to 103, 104. That's Fahrenheit, that's quite high. So, um, I could have two negative emotions and a positive emotion. The negative emotion might be high anxiety. Another negative emotion might be real concern. And the positive emotion might be happiness. Okay. Well, the negative emotion, the dysfunctional negative emotion, anxiety is not helpful. If I get highly anxious about that fever, I may not take the appropriate steps to get it down, right? Which would be called for in that situation. If I'm concerned, that's a negative emotion. Nobody likes to feel concerned. You don't wake up in the morning and go, whoa, I hope I have a real concerned day, you know? Um, but you can have concern and take the, appropriate, take the appropriate steps. Now, let's say you're happy. Now, that is utterly inappropriate and will sabotage a goal of lowering that temperature. You know, in fact, in the United States, if a parent was happy about that, then I have to call Child Protective Services, right, to get that kid some help in defiance of the parent. 
So that would be a clear example of a positive emotion that is not not helpful. It doesn't help re the goal of um, health and um, taking care of your child. Does that help? Okay, uh, now um, Sara Mahmood. <coughs> Hello, sir. It was uh, very well informative and an excellent session with you all. Um, I'm glad to be part of it. And uh, my question is that uh, early childhood experiences or just say the training by parents in that sort of uh, brought up when the attributes are mostly negative, then how come a child when grow up be like into positivity or rationality and linking it to the COVID-19, the A that has been defined as activating event, everything is negative. Uh, we have experienced like death, trauma, and uh, unfavorable conditions. So the coping or disputing if by religion or if by any sort of positivity, what would be the exact compact technique that should be applied? Thank you, sir. There are several questions in there. Um, one is, and let me disambiguate them, okay? The first part of your question was, if the child has grown up COVID or non-COVID with really, you know, um, maybe abusive or neglectful in an abusive or ne neglectful environment. We do the um, adverse childhood events. The ACEs score has been correlated with, um, with some negative outcomes, but not, it's not invariant. Um, and in fact, let me give an example of situations I have with my clients. Now, my specialty is, is treating PTSD and so, and co-occurring disorders. And the two major co-occurring disorders are um, major depressive disorder and substance use disorder. So let's say I have a child that's grown up with alcoholic parents, maybe somewhat neglectful and, and at times abusive. Not, not necessarily. Um, does that mean that that child will invariantly end up negative with experiencing negative emotions and be dysfunctional life? No. Largely, it, it can be different depending on the beliefs that that child forms, right? Um, and some of those beliefs, while not helpful as an adult, were adaptive when, as a child. Let me give an, give an example. Um, as a child, uh, if you were abused because when your dad was uh, drunk, then you learn to be quiet and not talk about your emotions. That was adaptive for the child. Now they get married and let's say the guy, um, when he has negative emotions, won't share with his wife. That's not adaptive. So we might have to do some therapy to help with that. Um, on the other hand, there are children that go, you know what? My parents were alcoholics. It's too bad that they were the way they are, but you know what? I'm gonna go on in, in life. And somehow they have that resilience and they were able to hold those beliefs and they do fairly well. The other thing to keep in mind is we do need to take very seriously adverse childhood events and when parents are not acting appropriately to get those children, uh, children help. But a wonderful study that came out of Harvard a few years back found that with parents who were highly dysfunctional, that the children's outcome can be quite good if they have significant relationships outside the family. So for example, at school, um, in the mosque or the synagogue or the church, you know, um, uh, other families that there's contact with, right? That those children can be um, more resilient. And the other interesting thing that's more COVID related is that I'm finding that there's sometimes a discrepancy in terms of what the parents say is awful and what the children are. Many of the children were, um, some of them are kind of negative. The older they get, the more negative. But the young ones are, I get to be around my parents more than I ever get to be around them. You know what I mean? So while it's negative for us, we may be projecting that negativity on them. So. 
we need to watch our responses and tailor them to the individual. Let me give a, an example with that. I'm sorry I'm taking so long. But I was working, um, not, not clinically, but uh, working with um, uh, a situation where father was in prison, the mother had, was dying of cancer, and she had 10 children. And she died. There was the funeral. And the littlest child was crying and carrying on. And when I asked, and they said, can you go and fix this child? I mean, well, I can't fix the child because children aren't fixable. You know what I mean? They're not things to be fixed. But um, they thought that she was crying. She was grieving the death of her mother. But when I asked the, the little girl what it was, that was not what she was thinking. And I'm glad I asked the question because she said, how is mommy going to be able to breathe in that box? You know, that was her concern. And so I said, you know, your mommy's body is, is different right now. It's amazing. She doesn't have to breathe in that box. She's going to be just fine in there, you know? And so she was okay. She went away skipping and she was happy. So that was her question. We addressed that question where she was at. So I think often with children at what those different ages are, we have to find out what they are believing is awful and then match our answer to where, wherever they are with that. I hope that's helpful. Okay, Sidra Malik. Hi, Dr. Asir. Hi, Dr. Steve. Nice to see you both. Hello. So I am live from London right now and I'm so thankful for this session. Um, I felt like in last 45 minutes, I've read a whole book on REBT, thanks to Dr. Steve. That was really amazing. Um, oh, no, you won't buy my book. Okay, but <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> I, I would love to, if it's free, but yeah. <laughs> so um, in terms of activi activating event, Dr. Steve, I personally believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, that sometimes, but most of the time, we give power to the activating event itself. The, activate, the activating event might not be as powerful, but we make it powerful by the way we perceive it. So we can make a rope look like a snake <laughs> uh, by the way we are perceiving it. So I'll give you an example. I had this client who was saying that, oh, I'm calling my husband right now and he's not answering. So maybe he's with a woman. And that thought came from because her husband cheated on her. And uh, <laughs> I said to her, where is he right now? And she said he's in the gym. And I said, maybe his phone is not with him or maybe the battery is low. And she was like, no, I think he might be with another woman because he's not picking my call. And afterwards, sorry about that. <laughs> so afterwards, when um, her husband did call back, he said, you know what? My battery was low. That's why I couldn't answer your phone. So she was giving the power to that event by how she was perceiving it. So I think it's really interesting what you said about our beliefs and our perceptions. Secondly, I really like the idea of fasting. Um, and maybe we can do a study on fasting across religions, because it's not only Muslims who are fasting, it's in Hinduism as well, in Christianity. Um, there's intermittent fasting, which I've heard about. And Hindus, they keep this moan breath where they can go without talking for half a day. Um, so it's really interesting as to how fasting across religions is quite consistent and helpful. Well, you're there in London with all those religions. So I think we just, yeah. have, the, uh, we just have the research project for you. Absolutely. So we can look into that. Thank you, Steve. That was brilliant. Yeah. I like the example that you gave, you know, and in REBT, we look at two kinds of solutions. We'll look at the practical solution and the emotional solution. And so by looking at what you did was look at the A and try to come up with an alternative A or alternative explanation, you know? And so that's a practical solution. I think, you know, that's okay. Usually REBT won't stop there though. So what we would like to be able to help that woman with was say, let's say he is with another woman, right? And so, and because um, if we can help her not disturb herself so much about the possibility, and it's possible, right? Guys have affairs, 
women have affairs, you know, that that's, you know, there are no guarantees in this stuff. And so if we could get her to disturb herself less about the possibility, because she's not disturbing herself about the reality, she's disturbing herself about the possibility. It's not even that, we don't even know yet, right? If we can get her not to disturb herself about the possibility, then she's gonna be more resilient in the face of whatever he does, you know, and she's not gonna be hiring a private investigator if he's five minutes late coming home, right? And, and checking to see if there's lipstick on his collar at, at, or, <laughs> or little notes in his coat to see if, you know, that there's a foreign telephone number on it, right? That we, real, we say, you know, but I think we don't know, we, we'd have to ask the client, but it seems as though she may want to guarantee that he is not in with another woman. You don't get it. You don't get it unless you hire somebody to walk around with him all the time. Mm -hmm. So there is that practical solution and at times we deal with the practical solution. But I think we try to deal with the emotional solution because mm -hmm. if we don't deal with the emo emotional solution, she may come up with all kinds of possibilities that Absolutely. are really quite out there about him. I mean, sometimes even bordering on delusional possibilities <laughs> right, for, for them. So yeah, I think you did a great job of bringing out the practical solution Thank you. and how we would like to go to the emotional solution too. Uh, just one more thing, Steve, in terms of COVID-19. So I had this client who said to me recently that, oh, um, he had this high anxiety and he thought, what if I'm the last person alive on this earth? Because COVID is killing everyone. <laughs> and he was talking about, and I think a lot of anxiety is being induced by the media. And we need to, I think, discuss it more uh, with our clients as to how sticking to the news all the time is not very helpful during this pandemic. So he did say, what if I'm the last person on this earth and everybody's dead? <laughs> what am I going to do? And I said, look, you're talking about all these cases who have died and passed away. What about that Italian woman who is 102 years old? She has seen two pandemics in her life. She has heart disease, lung disease, and she has survived COVID-19. So it's like, oh, well, you know, he started thinking. I was like, I'm really not focusing on the positivity right now. <laughs> and I think people have a very negative concept of positivity too. So it's not something magical. It's about accepting how you're feeling, hugging your emotions, and then kind of learn to bounce back. Well, we do want you to face the emotion. That part is true. And yeah. RBC would want you to face emotion. And then if it is dysfunctional, to try to change it to the best to the degree. Often with anxiety, we begin with a what if. What if I'm the last person alive? Oh my gosh, that would be terrible, horrible, and awful because, and then we would fill in the because clause. And I think it's really interesting is Arnold Lazarus at Rutgers University had a technique in which he would say, let's turn your what if to so what if. So what if. And so I think what he does there by doing the so what if is that he's getting, look, what if, whatever your answer to what if is not causing your anxiety because business people sit around and do what if. It's called brainstorming, right? But they're not anxious. But if we, it's the what follows. Oh, that would be terrible. That would be horrible. I couldn't stand that. That's the anxiety producing part. And if you do the so what if, we kind of get rid of that. The other thing is that one is if we, anxiety is present when the inference is that there is an overwhelming threat. And we've done that with COVID, that this is an overwhelming threat. And it is a threat. And we need to helpfully, I mean, and preferably acknowledge that you can die and that it is an inconvenience. Um, but in the short run, not to see it as threat only, but also opportunity. And so I've had people say, oh, my, my job is completely out. And um, I'm seeing this wonderfully among millennials. I wish I were millennial, so you know, I, I'd have a chance to do this over. But the, um, they've, they've seen it as an opportunity to go and do something that they've wanted to do for a long time right? It's an opportunity to work on losing weight. It's an opportunity, I mean, all kinds of things. Now, that doesn't take away the threat. We acknowledge the threat, but move away from threat only. I think the trouble with COVID is we've perceived it as threat only, and it is a potential threat. 
Right. Do we have time for a couple more questions, Dr. Yeah. Jones? Okay. So Aftab, Dr. Aftab Nasser. Um, thank you so much, sir, uh, Dr. Asif, and thanks, uh, Steve, for your very, very interesting talk. Um, I just want to take you a little bit away from RET and um, talk about uh, uh, what you said earlier in your talk about um, incorporating religion or psychotherapy. My main question is around the concept. I didn't hear what you said there. Um, I, I want to talk about the concept of self, but uh, the earlier part of your talk where you were talking about uh, incorporating self or religion into the psychotherapy. Um, so my, here is my problem. Um, when we talk in religious terms, the concept of self actually rests on the idea of submission, total submission or relational transcendence or this other directedness um, that is sort of a cosmological order where we are one part of the bigger equation, let's call it. While when we read through psychotherapeutic uh, or psychological literature, um, the concept of self is more and more uh, developed in a very, let's say, a Eurocentric um, way uh, through the age of modernity, then coming down to Freud and the, the rest, um, which actually sort of inflates this bubble, which we call self. Na? So for, for me, there's always a problem. How do we sort of, um, resolve this equation where what we are trying to do here is uh, embed the sense of IMS in psychotherapy uh, while in belief system or in religious sense uh, the sense of IMS is rather related to a bigger cosmological uh, structure. How do you see, how do you fix that? You want little old me to fix that, that big religious debate um, and the, the problem of the West. I have to tell you, I am, I, REBT at least does not dictate how you view the self. However you view the self, we believe that what contributes to mental health are two things, unconditional self-acceptance and the unconditional acceptance of the other, and the other can be God, right? And so we don't see that there has to be a war between those two, right? Um, and so we don't get into that. In fact, if you read our ABT, there will not be a philosophy of the self. Now, if you go to ACT, they're going to have three kinds of selves, right? We don't have that. In CBT, they'll look, they tend to look at self as a schema. We don't necessarily have that in, in REBT. Some people hold that. And I like the fact that with an REBT, believe whatever you want about the self. Um, and, um, and what we do know, a very book, a great book by Emmons on the um, psychology of ultimate concern uh, the relationship between motivation and spirituality. And he found that we need, for health, we need short-term goals and long-term goals. And, you know, RBG says we are goal-directed creatures, so this goes right along with us. One of those long-term goals, most of our long-term goals are about those things that are transcendent, right? My long-term goal may be to be imperfect, well, I'm not a Muslim, right? But if I were a Muslim, it might be to be in perfect submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Um, but um, um, that there may be another transcendent goal. Let's say someone who doesn't believe in God, their transcendent goal might be um, to strive for justice in the world, okay? So we will take whatever that transcendent value is we don't see that as um, those as internecine with REBT that they're not they're not necessarily in conflict. Now, if your transcendent goal is to murder people and have them for lunch, then we've got a problem. Okay, but most you know I don't I don't know any religions that are going to be advocating that kind of thing. And I'm I'm not being flippant. I'm just saying that um, REBT take whatever you want as the transcendent, right? and how you conceptualize the self and don't be self-defeating in that, in that process. One of the things that my good friend, uh, James McMahon, the late James McMahon and I worked on is, um, let me, I'm going to draw something and 
I hope you can see it. It's horrible. I didn't, I didn't do well in, in, um, in art. That circle is called the self. You see it? It's an oblong. And then there are lines out at the side. Those are our roles, the roles that the self has. And notice that some of those lines are closer to the self than the others. There are a little others are farther away. So what Jim and I said was, leave that self alone. Unconditionally accept that self. Look at your roles. And what are your roles in life? Your role. I have a role as a professor. I have a role as a husband, as a father. I have a role as a subscriber to the New York Times. I have the role of um, as um, a follower of God. Okay, so um, some of those roles are very close to me: being a follower of God and being a father. I take very seriously. And the closer we are, the closer that role is, the value that we put on it to the self, the more likely we are to disturb ourselves, right? So if I act inappropriately or say something bad to my daughters, I'm more likely to get upset than if I leave the New York Times paper out on the lawn and it gets wet. I'm not going to beat myself up because I'm only out $20 or whatever the charge is for, for that thing. So we would say unconditionally accept the self and look at your behaviors within your roles and then try to say whether those behaviors are helpful for you in reaching that role or not helpful. So as a Muslim, you can look at your behavior and see whether those behaviors help you to reach your goal or not. There's a hadith I really like and it is about, um, I can't remember the hadith Nabu or Qudsi, but it's a really nice hadith that if you see an object in the road, right, then you you pick that you pick that object up, and if you do, you'll get baraka. Okay, so beautiful, beautiful, um, a beautiful hadith. So it is telling us about acting in ways that help those who will encounter a problem uh, later on. You know what I mean? It's a beautiful a beautiful message about about that. So let's say you act in ways that didn't help somebody, right? You cheated or whatever. You know, if you have that transcendent value that you want to be better at submitting to Allah, then that is a behavior that would be very important for you to change, okay? But focus on the behavior, leave that self alone, just let it. I had a professor in college, it was in metaphysics, and he brought a cucumber in. And he put the cucumber on the table and he says, what is this cucumber doing? We thought that he had spent too much time in philosophy and he needed to take a vacation, right? But um, he said, it's cucumbering. Why? Because that's what cucumbers do. And that's a self. Just leave the self alone. Let the self be a self. Don't evaluate it. Because what are you going to use to evaluate the self? Let me give an example. I know a person, it was years and years ago, she came in and said, she said, I'm a failure as a human being. I said, nice to meet you. I never met one of those. And so, um, and so I, anyway, I asked her to keep a little log of everything that she did for the week, you know, before she came in. And so I said, she says everything. And I went, yeah, you wake up in the morning, right? I woke up in the morning. I took my shower. I made some toast. I got on the subway, went uptown. So I got this, she brought it in. And I said, so how did you do with the shower? I was fine. Uh, how was your toast? My toast was fine. Uh, what about the subway ride? You needed to go uptown? Yeah. Uh, did you go uptown east or west? She goes east. So I said, did you take the inner the R? Did you take the one and nine and end up on the, on the west side? Okay. No, I know. And then I said, ah, lunch. How was lunch? She goes, it was bad. I deliberately picked a fight with my boyfriend. I went, bad. That is not good. Deliberately pick a fight with the boyfriend. And so I said, wait a minute, but your toast was okay. And you got on the right train, but you are a failure as human. And you know what she said? Those don't count. And I said, that's your problem. You are arbitrarily choosing one thing 
to make a global evaluation of the self. You're too complicated. There are too many things that you do, too many things that you value, too many emotions that you have. Anything that you pull out is going to be arbitrary. So why don't you just focus on, you know, fixing that relationship with the boyfriend and not pick a fight with him so often, <laughs> you know. Um, but, you know, if he's a keeper, then he'll forgive you. Um, so I think if we approach the self in that way, and, and REBT, I think, is very accepting of whatever your theory of that is, okay? Great. Um, one last question. If um, uh, Nidan Oshin, do you have a question? <coughs> Hello. Hello. Jean Nidan. Thank you so much, sir, for arranging this very insightful session. I actually do not have a question. I just have a comment about the situation of COVID-19. I don't know about uh, many people around me, but uh, as uh, far as I'm concerned, COVID felt like a relief, a retreat to me. Because one thing uh, is very important. Yes, I was optimizing my life situation a lot. And life was pretty difficult since last few years. But COVID to me, um, ironically, I don't know. I feel like uh, it's a relief. It's a retreat that I was trying to get from life. And I don't know about anxiety. It did not induce any anxiety in me. COVID actually helped me reduce my anxiety <laughs> that I was having before COVID. <laughs> I'm really sorry. Thank you so much. But overall, it was a very beautiful session. And actually, what you point out is quite helpful. COVID is not causing the anxiety. If COVID was causing the anxiety, then everybody would have to be anxious. And not everybody is anxious. So it's not COVID, but it is our beliefs about COVID. Now, COVID is bad. Let's not minimize that, right? It, I mean, it kills people. I've lost some friends to COVID one last week. I, I lost. It's not good. Um, and um, and it's, it, it is inconvenient because now I can't, I just sneaked into the university because there's nobody around here now. But when classes start, I won't be here, right? Because, um, you know, I'm old and I have pre-existing conditions. So I have to be careful. But that points out, what you point out is it is not the A, it is the B that causes the emotion. And so I'm very happy that you gave that example. The other thing is, your inference is different than those who have anxiety. Your inference is not that this is an overwhelming threat, right? Because the inference that this is a threat sets the stage. It doesn't cause the anxiety, but it sets the stage about which people have irrational beliefs that then would subsequently cause the emotion. But you don't have the inference. So you didn't, you didn't take that even first step toward moving toward the anxiety. So, Yay, and your inferences are fine. So Mazel Tov, congratulations that you're not experiencing that anxiety, right? Uh, there is one more question, uh, Dr. Johnson. Shall we take it? Please. Okay. okay. Dr. Taimur Kiani is, um, he teaches drama, especially Greek tragedy, I think. Um, oh, wow. So let's see what he has. So okay. he, has a, he has an Oedipal question. <laughs> yeah, first of all, I, you know, my comments, you know, I, I feel so great that, you know, a psychologist is, is writing a novel. <laughs> so it's, it's well, a, wait till you it's see a great the news for. <laughs> wait till you see it. <laughs> uh, and my question is that, you know, uh, are you applying any psychological uh, theory on in, in this novel? Are you planning to apply, you know, uh, because, you know, there's a link between literature and uh, psychology. Um, I don't know. I don't want to turn it into a psychotherapy text, but I don't mm -hmm. know if I will be able to avoid um, some things. And so um, it, um, I, I would, my fear is that as I write this, not so much that I'll incorporate too much psychology, but that I'll go too philosophical and everybody will be asleep by the end of the novel, you know? So um, I do think I'll probably incorporate some psychology and some uh, 
philosophy, but I know I'm not going to be as good as uh, Sophocles and, you know, Euripides and all of those guys, you know, they're, they're just classic. I just wish that Freud had read it properly, you know? <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, if there are no further questions, um, thank you very, very much, Dr. Johnson. As I um, said earlier in the beginning of the talk, uh, Gift University is located in a very disadvantaged area of Pakistan. And uh, we rarely get opportunities to have luminaries and great scholars such as yourself um, visit that part of the world. So one opportunity that we were afforded was your online presence from which I learned a lot and I'm sure the audience learned a lot. I would uh, like to express my gratitude and uh, say hopefully when things are better we might have an opportunity to host you in Pakistan and especially in Gujranwala, where our university is located. So once again, thank you very, very much. Thank you guys so, so, uh, so much. Be blessed. Okay. Goodbye then. Thank you. Goodbye.